So without more ado, Chris, tell us about your book. Yeah, um, I really am too old for this because I'm now 90. And I the worst thing of being old is short-term memory. So I've had to write it down, otherwise um, you know, it, it will be lost. Uh, the first thing is, will future generations be interested? Um, of all our grandchildren, we have got one who is, and I gather talking that uh, the whites have also got one, which is, is, is OK. Um, so this ambulance request came up, and um, it simply wouldn't have been possible without Stefan's help, because um, everything I, I sort of tried to do, I kept on forgetting, and then he brought it up. Anyway, um, the point is, it is more accessible, and we hope that um, it will um, be of use throughout the world. The thing that gets me about uh, <coughs> Bristol's is that there is not enough knowledge of the, what we call the world car. Um, when I uh, sort of first investigated and found all this stuff, we found what George White had written. Um, this was the other big book. And he was absolutely emphatic at what his plans were. And it seems to me that if uh, it had gone well, we would have Bristol's where there are Audis, BMWs, and Mercedes. And this constantly irritates me that we haven't. And because of the plans that you will see in the book, with the petrol tank in a different place. You could have an estate car, so the estate cars that are out there, including ours, would all have been Bristol's. And this would have made a great difference. Um, the UK distributors, which I've got a list of, um, not just Anthony Cook, for whom I have still the greatest regard, but we felt we could do a book before his time. The UK distributors would undoubtedly have supported there's a list at the back and showing just how many went to all the main distributors. And the next appendix is of the global awareness, which was discovered through various people. And um, it just shows that literally all around the world, uh, there was knowledge and ability to receive this wonderful car that was coming. Now, this car had the Moulton Flexitor suspension. Um, how many people sort of know all about the suspension? A few, a few obviously do. Um, one of the most interesting days of my life was uh, spent with um, Alex Milton when he was about 80. And we went through all this. And he explained, I mean, I'm sure you know, but you, you've got that sort of circular thing. And the, the, the rubber thing goes in there, and it twists like that. And it really does work. And uh, I, it was an, written it down somewhere. There was an enormous number of gypsies were sold, Austin gypsies, and also Bond mini cars. So it worked. And um, it's just a, a great deal of pity. But uh, Fritz Feidler, who you all probably remember know about, he got it absolutely right when he said the peculiar difficulties of car production in the same factory as aero. And the metal workers are needed for aeroplanes, and so we got on to part wood for 405 and 404, but not yours, Geoffrey. And um, to cope with the aeroplane-related crisis, um, if you look on the internet, it seems that each, each Britannia cost 768,000. Now, you can imagine not one of those 768,000 went to Bristol cars. And so um, they just could not go on. And uh, we were very lucky, again, thanks to Stefan, that we got uh, these photographs of the, um, the world car. Um, and. Uh, you see in the book that it was an almost uh, Mercedes BMW literally 10 or 15 years before his time. However, there it is, and um, it means a lot to me because the same thing happened to my father in the aeroplane industry, and it was a fact that various happenings, including government, 
meant that they were denied this opportunity. They could not build their own factory as they had intended to for the cars, and uh, they had the metal workers taken away at a critical time, which led to the wooden 45, etc. So that's really all I want to say. <laughs>